Okay, we are going to get started. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Megan Arias. I am a training manager here at Healthcare Education and Training, and I will be facilitating um, the webinar today titled Being Trauma Informed in Reproductive and Sexual Health Care. Next slide, please. Um, so this webinar has closed captions available and to enable those, you're gonna hover over your main screen, click at the bottom where it says live transcript and then click show subtitles. And you can change these settings um, by clicking subtitle settings. There should also be um, subtitles that pop up uh, once the presenter is speaking on her end um, that you'll be able to see on your screen as well. And for more information and to keep up to date with HCT events, please be sure to follow HCT on the various social media platforms and be sure to visit our website. So now I'll quickly review some housekeeping information. Um, a link to complete the event evaluation will be sent to you in the chat at the end of this webinar, as well as in an email format following up um, and your feedback is greatly appreciated. You can find archived presentations and a list of upcoming events that can be viewed on our website. And if you have any technical difficulties during this presentation, please contact updates at hcet.org. Next slide. Um, so in order to receive nursing contact hours, a participant must do the following, um, attend the entire webinar, return the completed participant evaluation post-test and complete the nursing contact hour form and email it to kbradford at hct.org. And all of this information can be found on the slides which were sent out to you earlier today, as well as um, in the follow-up email that you will be receiving later this afternoon. And you will receive another evaluation in about three months um, to address the objectives of this webinar. Um, and it will evaluate how the objectives are being implemented into your healthcare setting. So please keep a lookout for that email as it's an important follow-up. The presenter does not disclose any um, actual potential or perceived conflicts of interest. And throughout the presentation, we encourage you to send your questions via the Q&A box. And to submit a question, you're gonna hover over the main screen and then select the Q&A icon at the bottom. And then once that's selected, um, a box should appear on your screen. And to submit a question, you just type it into there. Um, those questions can be placed as anonymous um, and we will hold all questions until the end at that designated Q&A time. So without further ado, I will introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Dr. Kara berg -Ronick. Dr. berg is the Director of Clinical Quality at Healthcare Education and Training, where her work focuses on improving reproductive and sexual health outcomes throughout the Midwest. She maintains a clinical practice as a nurse practitioner in the women's health and family planning using and advocating a trauma-informed approach has been central to her philosophy of care since early in her career. When she moved, when she worked as a certified sexual assault nurse examiner at the Cleveland Clinic, she has also served as a SANE consultant for the Indiana Coalition to End Sexual Assault and Human Trafficking. Her doctoral research on vicarious trauma among Sexual Assault Nurse Examiners was published in the Journal of Forensics Nursing, and she was recently published in the Indianapolis Star advocating a trauma-informed approach following the universal trauma of 2020. Dr. berg Ronick teaches frequently in community, academic, and professional settings on various sexual health, trauma-informed care, and forensic nursing topics. So without further ado, I will pass things over to Dr. Kara to kick us off. Okay. Thanks so much, Megan. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm so happy to have the opportunity to um, talk about this topic that um, I think is so important. Um, I'm glad that you think it's important enough to be here with us as well. Um, okay, so I know that um, there's a range of folks in the room from different Yes. Your um, sounds just cut out a little bit. So if you just want to restart. Oh, okay. 
Cool. No, that's fine. Um, that might have been on my end, but no, totally fine. Uh, the last time Megan and I presented together, my internet went down. So we're just having some bad deja vu. Um, so I'm so sorry. Um, okay, hopefully you heard me say how excited I am um, to be with you and talking about this important topic. I know that we have um, a wide range of professionals in the room who work with reproductive and sexual health in a variety of ways. Um, and that also means that there's probably a range of experience and knowledge on trauma and on trauma-informed care in the room. So my goal for today is that we will sort of develop a shared language and framework at the beginning. So even if this is your first exposure, we'll have kind of a common starting place, but then hopefully we'll take the discussion to places that even folks who have a lot of previous knowledge and exposure to these topics haven't quite gone before. Um, my perspective is that of a clinician, um, but hopefully um, we'll, we'll do kind of some broad examples and you'll be able to find something valuable no matter your role in this work. Um, we've got some objectives up there. Um, Megan, please feel free to just shout out again if anything goes wonky because, um, you know, Zoom life, right? Okay, so here we go. We're going to start by talking about simply what is trauma, okay? We're using a definition from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services definition, which says, individual trauma results from an event, series of events, or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening, and that has lasting effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. So, you can see kind of these three big components, the event, the experience, and the effects, right? Um, one of the things that is key here is that how a trauma is experienced is central. So what that means is that how a person experiences an event determines whether or not it's traumatic. That's not something we can put on them. That's something they sort of decide for themselves, right? So something that's traumatic for one person may not be for someone else. Um, kind of the example that I'll often use is if you think about siblings that are removed from a home where there's abuse, okay? For one of those siblings, the removal itself may be deeply traumatic, right? Even though that is what is uh, taking them away from the abuse, simply the separation from home, from familiarity, from family may be the deepest source of trauma. Where for the other, that may be um, read in a totally different way, right? This is their escape and a start to healing, right? And a removal from the trauma. Um, and that could be different based on birth order, age at the time, simply personal characteristics of the person experiencing it, right? Um, but sometimes that's helpful to think about how that experience shapes uh, what is trauma or not. These, uh, the threats um, that can be these, uh, these events can be real or perceived. So that's another important uh, component, again, that we can't quite figure out um, necessarily from the outside whether or not it was traumatic because the threat could simply be perceived. Effects can be immediate or delayed, long or short term. Um, and exposure to trauma can be both direct and personal. It can also involve witnessing trauma to others or an indirect exposure. So um, through traumatic experiences of a family member or loved one. I will mention just really quickly, since we're in sort of a healthcare setting, that if we're looking at the DSM-5 definition of trauma, they really narrowed their definition um, from the DSM-4 to the DSM-5 and really kind of took away this key element of experience. They tried to make it much, much more objective. Um, and while I appreciate the reasons that, that they sort of uh, walk through that, I think for the discussion that we're going to have and when we're thinking about um, what a trauma-informed approach looks like. Um, we really need to stick with this sort of SAMHSA broader um, definition. So I'll just put that out there if people are interested um, to do a little more research on that. So this next piece, I'm gonna ask that you um, engage with me a little bit so that we don't have to listen to me talk too much. Um, it's much more fun if it's in person and we can like have a conversation, but instead I'll ask that you try to use the, um, the chat a little bit, which means go over to the chat and you'll notice you've got options of either hosts and panelists or everyone. If you're comfortable, go ahead and switch that to everyone so that um, so that the whole the whole crew can sort of see what you're saying. Um, although I'll try and repeat it in case uh, some come through in the other way. 
So when we think about events, that first E from that definition, we're kind of talking about some categories or types of trauma. So we can sort of think about it in these four ways. When we think about acute trauma, so a single or short-term event that is traumatic, what kind of things fall into that category, do you think? Toss some stuff in the chat for me. Give me some ideas. A car accident, absolutely. Um, any kind of accident, a sudden death. Thanks, Susie. A natural disaster, any kind of unexpected loss. One violent interaction, absolutely, Robin. So um, we think a lot about sexual assault here, right? Um, especially in the reproductive and sexual health context. Um, you can feel free to keep throwing stuff in, but I'll start moving on to our next. Um, how about chronic, ah, medical treatments absolutely could be, right? Um, kind of a, a um, we could have an obstetric emergency that could be an acute trauma, right? There's lots and lots of things that could be an acute uh, incident. If we move on to chronic, which here we're talking about repeated or prolonged exposure. So um, th throw some out there. We've got um, Hope is saying growing up in an abusive home. Absolutely. Chronic. COVID. Yes, you're like stealing my thunder for later, but absolutely. I would argue that uh, we have all been living through a trauma um, for the last two years, right? Um, really a universal ongoing trauma, um, which by the way, also can have an acute exacerbation, right? A sudden loss from COVID or, or it hitting your household, right? Versus just the sort of general living through this. Um, so many good examples coming up in the chat. Thank you. So chronic uh, trauma could be things like family violence, community violence, long-term illness, I see chronic pain conditions, uh, living in poverty or unhoused, exposure to war, forced displacement, um, even, uh, I always want to say even simply as, as the last uh, sentence, but this isn't simple, um, living with undocumented status, right? Um, just, just living your life in that way could be a chronic uh, trauma. Um, complex uh, trauma can be a little bit more, com a little more complex. Um, so this is, this is a trauma that is um, sort of exposure to multiple traumatic events over time, and it often has an interpersonal context. That's one of the keys, okay? Um, so this, we often think about um, abuse within a caregiving system, okay, that could be physical, emotional, or sexual, could be ongoing neglect by caregivers. Um, witnessing domestic violence certainly would fall in this category. Experiencing human trafficking would fall in this category. Really, it is severe, it is repetitive, and it's often, although not always, in childhood. Um, it's also typically associated with feelings of hopelessness or that there's no end in sight is part of that complex trauma. Okay. Now, um, I'm seeing that Katie threw racism in there when we were talking about um, chronic trauma. And racism uh, is one that falls into, I think, in many ways, many of the categories um, and is a really nice segue as we start to talk about historical trauma. So historical trauma would be the systematic oppression of particular groups across generations. Can people give me some examples of historical trauma? Slavery, absolutely. The Holocaust, lack of home ownership. Yes, okay, genocide, police brutality, forced relocation, right? Um, with all of this in mind, we have to remember that our patients and clients are often bringing a really well-earned historical mistrust of the healthcare system and GYN care in particular. Yes, Jessica just raised forced sterilization, right? GYN care in particular. We know that there is a legacy of violence and trauma um, in the work that we do, right? Um, from Henrietta Lacks, who is a black woman who in 1951 had her cells taken during cancer treatment without her knowledge or consent to be used in medical research. Someone in the chat mentioned Tuskegee, right? Where black men were followed for 40 years from 1932 to 72 to see the progression of syphilis, right? This was without their consent and also went on well after treatment for syphilis was available. Y'all, 1972 is actually not that long ago, 
right? Um, even the fact that Dr. Sims, known as the father of gynecology in the 19th century, exper experimented on enslaved Black women without anesthesia, and I think it goes without saying without their consent, right, has sown this, again, well-earned mistrust, okay? Um, systems level and historical trauma enter our encounters every single day. And as, as was mentioned, um, some experiences like racism, religious persecution, sexual and gender discrimination can fall into multiple categories, certainly hit that historical, certainly hit that chronic, and can also be added onto with an acute um, sort of incident or exacerbation. Okay. Um, thank you all for helping me uh, with that list. Um, so when we think about trauma, especially in reproductive and sexual health, acute trauma is often what comes to mind, right? We already mentioned kind of sexual assault. Um, we could certainly broaden that into the context of child abuse or intimate partner violence as well. And if we're looking to prove a why should people care or widespread impact, just those in itself is really enough. Um, the next statistics, I apologize, are presented in the binary because that's how the research and the statistics are. So um, I, I beg your forgiveness in that, but we know that one in three women and one in four men are victims of some sort of physical violence by an intimate partner in their lifetimes. And that one in six American women and one in 33 American men have been sexually assaulted, right? Just that in itself would be enough that we as healthcare, um, as healthcare providers and workers should care. But in truth, as we've covered, the examples are infinite, right? People seeking our services are absolutely bringing more into the room than what caused them to seek care, okay? So hopefully many of you have heard of the ACE study or of ACEs. If you haven't, this is your official invitation to go learn more. So the ACE study was born out of a partnership between Kaiser Permanente and the CDC in 1998. It's an amazing body of work and of over 17,000. And what they showed was that there is a dose response relationship between these adverse childhood experiences that you can see on your screen in these three categories of abuse, neglect, and these household dysfunction categories. Um, between experiencing these things in childhood and a huge range of negative health and life outcome um, uh, categories, okay? Um, just, just for the record, it's a plus minus, right? Has this happened to you? Yes, no, not a how many times did this abuse happen? Okay, your score can be zero to 10. Um, and uh, one of the other things that I wanna lift up in this, well, let me start with this. Um, from the original 10, we learned that these are incredibly common. 64% of people have experienced at least one ACE and 12.5% have four or more. Four or more is the point where we see that um, relationship just uh, increase exponentially between the negative health outcomes and the ACE score, but at any level it contributes. One of the things that I have to mention when we're talking about ACEs is that this original population out of Kaiser Permanente um, was really overwhelmingly white and um, upper middle class-ish, right? So since that time, a lot of additional work has been done um, in a lot of, of areas, but um, there was a, a great branch of the study that was done um, out of Philadelphia um, in kind of the 2012 to 2015 uh, arena that expanded these categories to include um, what's been referred to as like the urban ACEs. So things like witnessing violence, feeling discrimination, adverse neighborhood experiences, being bullied, living in foster care. And the CDC with that has sort of acknowledged community violence and some other categories now when they're looking at trauma as well. So I've been alluding to what, is this, what does this contribute to these negative health outcomes? So it can be a million things, um, increased risk of injury, of mental health concerns, of substance abuse, of chronic diseases like cancer and diabetes, as well as decreased life opportunities. Um, I think it's really important to mention the chronic disease component because sometimes um, I think people are quick to say, well, it makes sense that if you're living in stress, you would have perhaps more depression, anxiety, PTSD, or okay, well, a uh, uh, physical violence is gonna to lead to increased injury or coping mechanisms like substance abuse. But this gets really interesting. It's, these are the folks who end up with, um, with things like emphysema, even when you have controlled for smoking, right? People who have never smoked a day in their life are more likely to have these lung conditions, things like that. Um, and certainly it impacts a lot of um, sexual and reproductive health 
uh, outcomes specifically, okay? Um, so to zero in on those, we know that uh, folks with a higher ACE score are more likely to have, um, to engage in risky sexual behaviors, including unprotected sex, to have an earlier sexual debut, multiple partners, higher incidence of HIV and other STIs, more likely to be involved in adolescent pregnancy, more likely to be involved in sex trafficking, or to suffer from chronic pelvic pain or other types of sexual pain, including vulvodynia and vaginismus. And also a topic that I think is top of mind for so many of us these days, um, and, and should be more and more to lift up, right? Also major maternal health concerns, um, including pregnancy complications and fetal death. Okay, um, so this is huge. If any of you are in school and need a paper to write something on, go find something about the ACE study and learn more. Um, it's just an incredible body of work. So we've already kind of hit that last bullet point, the health sequelae that, that come from, the, uh, that, that are these effects. Um, but we know that um, trauma has these huge effects on functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, spiritual well-being at all levels, right? Um, the neurobiology of trauma is really, really fascinating. We know that trauma can alter neurodevelopment, okay? Brain structures like the amygdala and hormones like adrenaline and cortisol respond to trauma by invoking the fight, flight, or freeze response, okay? Some people add fawn to this. You may have heard that. Um, and all of these are ways to seek safety, okay? When we're thinking about chronic and complex trauma, the protective responses of adrenaline and cortisol start to become toxic and they affect the prefrontal cortex. So we think about this a lot when we're talking about ACEs. Um, the example is always, so, so let's, let's think about um, olden times or, or, or right now, let's say it's right now and we are out in the woods, we're taking a hike and we come across a bear, right? We want our bodies to kick in. We, we, we depend on that fight or flight, right? To escape that bear, right? Um, and, and all of those responses are good. We get through it. We move through it. We escape the bear one way or the other. And we come back down to baseline. That's how our bodies are built to function, to keep us safe and protected, right? But what happens when instead it's a situation where the bear is living in our house, right? We never complete that cycle. We never make it through that increased stress is always there. Our bodies aren't built to function that way. And that's when we start to see this toxicity, okay? We know that trauma um, can alter the ability to uh, perceive and interpret information. It changes the way that memory is processed. Um, it changes our worldviews, okay? It changes our beliefs and how we see the world, both in terms of self and others. We know that when um, someone has experienced trauma, uh, they can experience shame and stigma and decreased hope and optimism. I've highlighted trust there because that is one of the um, sort of domains that can shift with trauma uh, that I think is especially important for us to think about in a healthcare setting, right? Um, this can make it difficult to form um, trusting therapeutic relationships, right? With care providers or other helping uh, figures, whether that's clinic staff or DIS, right? Um, also the ability to trust and benefit from relationships or form meaningful connections. And what does that mean for our patients or clients and intimate relationships, okay? Um, coping mechanisms we've touched on a little bit. These are really personalized strategies that allow people to function in their daily lives in the face of past or ongoing trauma, okay? Um, one of the things that's interesting about coping mechanisms is that from the outside, they often appear really dysfunctional and maladaptive. And, and sometimes they are, they can be harmful, right? Um, but ultimately we need to think of them as something that is facilitating survival for this person, okay? Um, some of the ones that we see commonly would be things like self-medicating or uh, reclaiming sexuality, right? Um, things like that. Um, we can also see dissociation, self-harm, anger and aggression that may feel misplaced. Um, there's any, any number of personalized coping mechanisms. As you can see from a lot of this, um, this can manifest in sort of a lowered ability to regulate behavior or control expression of emotions. Um, this can look like behavior that, that feels impulsive or out of control. And we need to really keep this in mind during healthcare visits or when discussing um, exposure, right? Like um, uh, scripts and norms might be 
totally out of the window, okay? The way that you expect a, a clinic visit to go or a discussion to go just may be out the window. And remembering that this might be part of what's going on can help you sort of recenter and, um, and approach in a trauma-informed way, okay? Um, let's talk for a brief second about activators. You may have heard this language just triggers um, more commonly, um, but uh, there's sort of a movement to, to uh, move towards the language of activator when you think that um, activate means to induce increased activity, um, where trigger means to fire a weapon, okay? Um, so to sort of move away from that like language centered in violence. Um, and also I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, talking about being triggered has sort of become a stigmatized um, and sort of, um, at times mocked, mocked term. So, um, so I prefer activators. Um, so when someone is activated, they may feel extreme distress that really mimics or feels very similar to what was experienced at the time of the initial trauma. Um, also a physical reaction can mimic uh, the reaction to an initial trauma. You could see vomiting, um, uncontrolled shaking, things like that that again, uh, may seem like they come out of nowhere. As you'll see on the slide, um, an activator can be conscious or subconscious and can come to us through all five senses. So you might not even be aware of the song that's playing in the background or a smell somewhere in your office or setting that can be something that's setting someone off, right? Um, we also can be unable to predict because these can be so personalized, right? Um, so, so providers may not be able to predict what's going to activate someone and a, a patient or client may not be able to predict. They may also be taken totally by surprise. Um, and it can of course um, cause a response like flashbacks, anxiety, panic, or, or dissociation, right? So with all of that background on sort of fundamentals of trauma, we'll move forward towards a discussion of trauma-informed care. Um, I know that we're mostly saving questions for the end, but, um, but if you have stuff, please feel free to be uh, sending it in. Okay. Um, okay. So a trauma-informed approach, we're again using SAMHSA's definition, which reads, a trauma-informed approach is one that realizes the widespread impact of trauma and understands the potential paths to recovery. It recognizes the signs and symptoms of trauma in clients, family, staff, and others. And it responds by fully integrating knowledge about trauma into policies, procedures, and practices, and then seeks to actively resist re-traumatization. All of this can be applied at an individual or organizational level, and it should guide the tone and process of care and interactions. So when we're looking at defining trauma-informed care, um, a big focus again is that four R's that we just talked about. So again, to realize impact, to recognize signs and symptoms, to respond with that trauma-aware uh, and trauma-informed knowledge, and then to resist re-traumatization. So you can kind of remember those four R's. The wheel on the right-hand side of the um, screen is six principles of trauma-informed care. And if we had more time, we could go through each principle and think about how we would operationalize them all. Um, but because we have a limited amount of time together today, we'll kind of just set this as a, as a framework. Um, and again, an invitation to go learn more um, and, and we'll kind of continue on. So trauma-informed care is a great academic topic. Um, it's, um, it's really, I, I think, really intellectually stimulating and all the things, but a lot of times people say, okay, that, like, that's great, and what does this actually mean and how do I apply it to take better care of the people that are in front of me or in my own life, okay? So if we're going to boil it down to one thing, if there's one thing you're going to take away with you today, it's the idea of this paradigm shift, that a trauma-informed approach necessitates the following shift. Instead of looking at someone and saying, what's wrong with you? You're going to say, what happened to you? Not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you? No matter how many times I teach this or talk to people about this, every time that I say that sentence, I feel it in my body. I like feel a softening and a whole shift. Um, and I think that that shift is what we need to lean into um, as we're thinking about how we can change our approach. So another really key component um, is that um, this needs to be a universal approach.
much. Okay. Um, standard precautions, the same way that when we're thinking about blood, we don't wait to get someone's um, lab results back to know if they have a bloodborne pathogen on board. We treat all blood as if it could be infectious, right? Um, we glove, we wash all the things, right? We need to approach our, our patients, our clients, and our whole communities really through that same lens. Okay, um, it is not enough to reserve this approach for special populations, right? Um, I often hear people say, well, I'm really, really thoughtful about this um, if I know it's someone's first pelvic exam, right? And that's amazing. They sh this is, we should use it there, but we should use it more broadly than that. I'll also hear um, often people say, well, yeah, if I know that someone has a history, th these concepts really make sense. Um, I, I also have had it brought up like we need to be really thoughtful at trauma-informed care in the LGBTQ community. That's absolutely true. We know that folks in that community are more um, likely to have experienced negative health interactions, other types of trauma, but it is not enough, right? we generated a massive list together that was not at all exhaustive. It is really fair, uh, even before 2020, but especially now to know that pretty much everyone we interact with, right, um, has experienced some type of trauma um, and deserves this approach to care, okay? Um, I've sort of alluded to this, but it's not just about patients. This is about colleagues and coworkers as well, about friends and family. And it's about you. Um, as caretakers, I think we're really bad at extending uh, sort of a, a, the generosity of gentleness to ourselves, right? Um, but, uh, but really, um, we as, as people who care for others um, are vulnerable to something called vicarious trauma. Um, and this is the idea that as we engage empathically with other people's narratives of trauma, right, which, which we do every day when we take care of other people, that that can actually impact our own worldview in a similar way to having experienced the trauma themselves. Um, and sort of to emphasize this, um, remember how I talked about how the DSM-5 uh, had really narrowed the definition of trauma? They left in the idea of vicarious trauma, that um, repeated exposure to details of traumatic events um, for those who work with trauma as part of their professional responsibilities, they left that in, in their definition of trauma. So um, again, extend this lens to yourself um, when you think about the way that you're moving through the world these days. Okay. Um, so moving on to sort of focus or moving on, moving back almost to, to focus back uh, in, our, in our area of interest on uh, reproductive and sexual health. So um, we covered most of what's on this slide, but just thinking about connecting the dots, um, I want to acknowledge that this isn't easy, right? Um, these can be difficult clients, right? Um, these can be sort of our frequent flyers where um, sort of our best efforts to support and help and guide just seem to fall a little short, right? Um, it's really natural that that can be frustrating and that's okay, right? Um, but when that happens, it is our work to remember um, it's hard to stay regulated in the presence of someone that is dysregulated, right? But that's our work. Um, when you feel like you've gone above and beyond in giving of yourself and then, and then someone and your time, right? And then, and then someone turns around and kind of doesn't follow your good advice or um, has sort of put themselves back in the same position, whatever it is that's sort of activating for you about that, these are the most important moments to practice that paradigm shift to remember it's not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you, okay? So um, I wanna like pause and ask for questions, but it's a webinar and you're not really there. So uh, we'll hold it till the end. Um, okay. Um, so we're gonna talk for a minute about the pelvic exam. And I know that some people uh, who are here may be actually uh, performing pelvic exams um, and other folks um, may, may just be sort of setting people up for that or at least adjacent to it, right? Um, if you're touching the world of sexual and reproductive health, we're thinking about pelvic exams, right? So there's a bunch of components that we have to think about here. The pelvic exam absolutely um, puts someone in a vulnerable physical position. 
period, right? Um, they're laying down, they're on their back, um, they're in, um, I hate the word stirrups, um, but that is kind of the medical word. I prefer to talk about it as, as foot rests, right? Um, but, but that's often how patients think of it, right? Um, and then you add to that, that's already sort of vulnerable enough, and you add to that now that we have asked them to undress, right? Um, they've removed clothing, they're under a gown or a drape, and the drape is probably made of crunchy paper that is like sweating and sticking to the table and isn't really covering you and you're cold, right? All of that is bad. And then you add to that that people's genitals are exposed, right? Um, and, and typically people don't love to be naked in front of a stranger and typically people don't love to have their genitals exposed. It's terribly vulnerable, period, right? Um, the clinician, as I mentioned, is a stranger or, or close to, right? Um, and then there's, there's power dynamics at play that we really just can't ignore, right? Um, so not only is the clinician certainly in a position of power, there's a knowledge differential, there's all kinds of um, different, different power differentials in that situation. There can also be feelings of medical necessity, right? So even if we're giving someone the opportunity to decline any part of our service, and we'll, and we'll talk about that more, there is this sort of um, honesty to this of, is there really, right? I may really not want to have a pap smear collected, but if I'm concerned about cervical cancer screening, I don't have much of another choice but to go through it, right? Um, so all of these dynamics at play. And then you had the exam itself, which is not super comfortable, right? It shouldn't hurt, but for some patients, it certainly does cause significant discomfort or pain. And then I'd also add that we cannot ignore the intimacy of the work that we do, okay? Um, I'm always uncomfortable with the word intimacy in the context of these, of, of these exams and, and, and of the work that I do. Um, there is a nurse midwife um, named Stephanie Tillman, who's really kind of at the forefront of talking about trauma-informed pelvic care. Um, she's written really beautifully and prolifically. Um, so you can look for her articles. Some are in the references at the end. Um, but um, she really uh, emphasizes calling this what it is, which is an intimate exam right? Um, that some of what we are doing um, mimics or resembles people's intimate lives, right? Things that have happened to them in their sexual lives, whether that's consensual or unconsensual, okay? And that we just kind of have to own that and be aware of that. Um, it's normal for us. I might do 30 pelvic exams in a day in clinic, right? But it is anything but normal for our patients, okay? Um, we also have to think about the activators that are present during the pelvic exam, if you have ideas, I'd love you to throw them into the chat, anything that you can think of that might be activating in this context. We've covered a lot of them, um, but some of the language that can be used, things like just relax, um, asking someone to open their legs wide, we should never be doing that. We have to be so thoughtful about our language, right? Um, that it's an exam table, not an exam bed, right? Not using sexualized language in this context. Um, Certainly, uh, you know, um, uh, it is, I think, becoming uh, less common, but I've certainly heard stories of um, uh, clinicians who sort of push someone's legs open into the uh, position for the examination, and we need to avoid doing that at all costs, right? Other techniques, right? Um, either to explain what you need with words, or um, sometimes I'll, I'll put my hands out where, where I need their knees to be, and I'll say, can you bring your knees to meet my hands, right? So I'm certainly never pushing, um, but that way they're in control of that movement, right? Um, so all of these things, um, again, if anyone else has ideas, please feel free to throw them in there. Um, okay. Um, so we also have to think about the context that's happening, right? Um, so th there can be, um, sort of proximity between healthcare and trauma, right? Um, a lot of times people think of the, the sort of the most obvious might be emergency care after a car accident or another kind of accident or um, seeing a sexual assault nurse examiner for a rape kit after, after an assault, something like that. But it doesn't have to be that um, sort of classic an example, right? There are so many things that could be traumatic that occur in proximity to healthcare. So this could be, uh, we mentioned earlier, obstetric trauma, um, even just learning about exposure to an STI, um, learning about infidelity, um, learning about an undesired pregnancy, um, 
any number of things that happen in our context that can be traumatic for someone. And, and the reason I think it's important to talk about this, this uh, context and proximity is that there's some research coming out that um, a, a like close relationship uh, in time between a trauma and a healthcare experience can blur the lines in someone's mind. Um, and, and can sort of complicate the memory of the traumatic event, uh, which can then lead to them being less likely to seek healthcare later. Um, so it's one of the reasons that that fourth R, that resisting re-traumatization is so important because it can have long-standing impacts for someone's long-term ability to seek healthcare. So um, sort of some key elements um, would be things like anticipatory guidance, right? We're always gonna tell people before we do it, right? Before we do what we're doing. Um, we're going to try to anticipate a range of responses and help them manage to the best of our ability, right? Um, we may or may not have a good skill set for that. We don't have to be um, social workers, maybe some of you are, right? Um, uh, to be in this work. Um, but it can mean managing anger or dissociation or difficulty with decisions, right? We're going to just be prepared and thinking about how we can help patients manage through this. Um, we're going to think about shared decision making and choice and control, okay? And we want to give our patients and clients as much power, choice, and control as possible. So that could look a, a million ways, right? Um, is it giving them the choice for an STI test of if they're being collected through urine or self swab or by an exam, right? Um, how could an exam be an opportunity for education and healing, right? Um, and, and I mean that because, you know, there are a lot of folks who um, have never been told that their genitals look normal, right? Um, I have had patients with penises literally weep in my arms um, on learning that something that they thought was really abnormal is just a normal skin variation, right? And, um, and I think about patients with vulvas and vaginas who really don't have an opportunity to see a lot of other vulvas and vaginas out in the world, right? Um, we, we don't even have urinals, right? So, um, so just to know that what you have in and on your body is normal and healthy appearing, if that's within your scope, right, um, can be really therapeutic. Um, how about expedited partner therapy, right? Um, ensuring that patients understand um, what, uh, what is being tested for and what isn't. Um, thinking about non-coercive, uh, non um, really uh, kind of patient-directed contraceptive counseling, right? Um, let, let's get on a soapbox for a second and, and talk about if a patient wants their LARC removed, they get it removed. Right, and that hasn't always been the case. Right, uh, there there have been times where where people have said, "Oh, like just give it a little longer," right, um, or or where where providers have refused to remove a lark from someone's body. Right, um, so so some things to think about with that. Um, when we think about permission, um, rather than just saying, "Okay, I'm going to do X, Y, or Z," we're going to say, uh, "Just think about subtle languaging." With your permission, I'll start the exam now. And then wait, okay? Um, now maybe for something like listening to heart and lungs, it's okay to say, I'm going to listen to your heart and lungs now and just wait for them to acknowledge, right? But for something that is um, you know, involving the genitals, we, we need to, to be a little more intentional, okay? Let me know when you're ready for me to begin the exam. Is it okay for me to begin the exam now, right? Subtle, subtle differences, but they can make a really big difference. Um, and that sort of points us into our deeper dive on informed consent, okay? So um, toss in the chat for me, um, and I'm seeing a couple of, okay, cool. Ah, sorry, what is removing a LARC? What a great question, I'm so sorry. So LARC stands for Long Acting Reversible Contraceptive, okay? So this would be things like IUDs or implants, okay? An IUD is a T-shaped device that goes into someone's uterus um, to prevent a pregnancy, and, and then implants live um, in the arm, okay? And they can be in place for uh, many years, depending on the type, um, but, but a patient typically cannot remove it themselves, right? So that's, that's what that one uh, is about. Thanks for that. Okay, cool. Um, this is my like distraction by the Q&A box, but all right. So I was trying to also stall to let you guys help me, uh, to let you people help me out uh, with what is consent? Um, throw some ideas up there. What is consent? I need some help. Sam says, providing full and accurate information for people to make decisions about their healthcare needs. Beautiful. What else? What's consent?
It can be like throw one word. What do you think? Explicitly saying yes, beautiful. Enthusiastic, providing risks and benefits, permission. Yes, all of these things. Thank you, yes. Knowing what they're agreeing to, absolutely. Okay, so I'm gonna, oh, let's see if the slide, there we go. Okay, so here, here's part of my list and yes to everything that was said, right? Unmistakable, often verbal, uncoerced and freely given can be reversed at any time. It is specific, right? Consent to uh, come into your office doesn't mean consent for every part of the exam or part of the experience, right? And it's informed, okay? Um, I mentioned Stephanie Tillman, that, that midwife, one of my favorite quotes. Um, uh, and actually, before I give you that quote, one final thought on this, just to remember, that the absence of a no is not a yes, right? It actually has to be an active process, okay? Um, so the quote from Stephanie that I like to lift up is, the consent is a clear dialogue between individuals to engage in a specific activity. Expectations for consent to intimate examinations in healthcare should be equal to, if not exceed expectations for intimate interactions in society. And I don't think that's always the case, okay? Um, so unintentional misunderstanding can happen for a thousand reasons, right? Including that what is routine for us is anything but for our patients and, and our clients. Um, also that when kind of that, that trauma brain is on, right? We talked about how things are processed differently in the context of trauma, right? It, it's right, right for misunderstanding. And also the context of just biological needs and deficits. Um, maybe someone is tired or hungry or worried about uh, picking up their kids or getting to work on time because, because your, your office was backed up or whatever else it is, right? Um, all of those things can increase um, sort of the likelihood of a misunderstanding occurring. So if someone doesn't believe that they have explicitly given consent, it can be perceived as assault, right? Um, and given consent freely, okay? Um, we have to think about those contexts, right? We've, we've talked about that a lot. Um, trauma history, historical violence or mistrust of the medical system, right? Um, how about coercion? Um, there can be a lot of coercion in a medical context, right? Um, so it could be things from uh, loaded or directed counseling, right? Um, for example, well, I prefer to do X, Y, or Z because in my experience, da, 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 right? Or, well, what I would want for my loved one is, right? And we get, we get people who ask us, well, what would you do or what would you want for a loved one all the time, right? And they've come to us because we have expertise in sexual and reproductive health, right? That's, that's the point. That's why they're there. But we have to be thoughtful about the fact that if we express um, a, a preference in that, in that space and then our patient or client for any reason, chooses something different that they may actually become really nervous about what that uh, will do to our therapeutic relationship or what we would think of them um, because they've sort of gone, gone against a recommendation, okay? Um, so from that sort of, um, again, directed counseling that can be somewhat problematic to more overt coercion. So I hear you declining, but what I really want to emphasize is, right? Um, and that actually is something I think someone put... Um, something that, that alluded to this in the chat that, that really um, kind of the full range of risks and benefits needs to be explained before seeking consent, right? Um, explaining the risks to declining only after someone has declined is coercive, okay? Um, and, then, and then finally to what can truly be defined as assault, right? So um, the clearest example is someone, you know, a provider saying, well, just another second after being asked to stop. Right, and I don't think that people do that maliciously. Right, I think um, uh, obtaining a Pap smear is sort of my go-to example here. Right, um, so they've come to you to get a Pap smear done. Right, and and you've already gone through uh, placing a speculum, and that's not anyone's favorite thing. And you're so close. Right, and gosh, this is what they came for. And so just one more second, you'll be done, and then they'll have it completed. But we would never let that stand. When, we talk, when we're thinking about or talking about um, consent in a sexual context, right? Um, no matter what is happening, if at some point someone says no or stop and the other partner continues on, right? Can you imagine this discussion if we're saying uh, that, that we're in a sexual context and someone says no and the partner says just another second, I'm almost done, right? 
um, that would be grossly unacceptable. So back to that quote from Stephanie, things that um, can be labeled coercion or assault in a social setting can be erroneously labeled as clinically or medical legally rational. Okay, um, so we're gonna avoid that. Um, we've already sort of talked about power dynamics. Um, and um, just as the absence of a no is not a yes, um, uh, we need to allow for a yes or a no at any stage um, of this encounter, right? Um, our informed consent process can't be one that expects a yes, okay? Um, patients also have the right to, uh, to excuse me, to in informed refusal or informed declination, okay? Um, and, and while I'm there, um, a note about language, right? Um, I really want people to think about um, the power of their words um, and the difference between saying that someone declines versus someone refuses, okay? Where is the like um, respect for autonomy um, and, and the sort of um, subtle, um, I wanna say like subtle disdain, right? Or subtle judgment um, in, in, in using um, the language of, of, of patient refuses, right? And we see that all the time in charting and in conversation. Okay, um, so just a couple other things to keep in mind. Um, we're wrapping up uh, soon, so we'll have some good time for discussion. Um, right on time, hooray. Usually I'm like rushing through, so this is great. Um, so a couple of other strategies that we can employ, um, and this is not in any specific order, um, but just some things to think about beyond what we've talked about already. So we always wanna be explaining steps, okay? Explain steps and equipment before beginning each step. So what to expect, the rationale, risks, benefits, and alternatives, right? This is starting to look suspiciously like an informed consent process, right? Um, you wanna think about um, sort of the place and space uh, that you're creating. So this could be things as subtle as positioning and comfort, right? Um, where are they in the room? Um, if you are doing a, a table visit, um, can you elevate the head of the table a little bit so that they're not flat on their back, right? Um, how, what else can we do for comfort? Um, eye contact or not, right? Um, if it's a phone encounter, which we're all much more uh, familiar with these days, um, you know, really checking, are they in a safe space and are they able to talk and do they have privacy, right? I think um, so often there's this uh, hurried nature in, when, we're, when we're dealing with healthcare and you've got a million phone calls to make in the day. And so uh, you really hope they answer. And if they don't, that's on them. Well, that, that's not the right dynamic right? Um, a trauma-informed approach is going to really make sure that someone is in a space where they can talk and listen and receive um, kind of what's what's going on, okay? Um, I have on their chaperone, there's a new recommendation from ACOG, um, uh, from, from the sort of professional organization for obstetricians and gynecologists, um, that there should be a chaperone for all genital or breast exams, okay? Um, and I know depending on uh, your work context, you, you may or may not be doing um, uh, exams, um, but uh, just something to sort of think about um, in teaching and in, and in uh, providing. Um, it may or may not be doable in the context that you're uh, working in, but I think it's something really important for us to be thinking about and sort of keeping an eye on as practice standards evolve. So a, a chaperone really um, is someone with um, sort of, a, it would be medical staff with training in best practices in all these areas, okay? So things like privacy and misconduct and reporting. So it's really different from an advocate and it's also really different from a, a family or friend being present, okay? Um, so something to keep an eye on and think about. Um, and from a, a trauma-informed perspective, um, someone could feel like for all those benefits, having an extra person in the room is not worth it, right? Um, so again, that being an option um, um, is something to explore. Um, we've talked a bit about empowerment and reassurance already, okay? Um, so many things in the world of sexual and reproductive health are stigmatized. Um, and so often, um, people come to us um, sort of with, with this shame of, gosh, I'm here um, because maybe I've done something that's perceived as bad or risky or, or something else, right? Um, and, and you have a lot of power to help um, sort of lift up their strengths, right? Um, you're here today, 
Like, look how responsibly you're acting and taking care of your health and wellness today. And I'm so proud, right? Um, or maybe it's proactive. Maybe they're seeking contraception, right? Like, whatever it is, um, you can frame it um, in a way that really um, lifts them up, right? Um, and, and then again, we talked about reassurance when warranted and if it's in your role and scope that things are healthy or normal um, and that that can be really, really powerful. Um, when we think about um, patient preferences for communication, okay? Um, so uh, do they want all the information? Do they just want the minimum needed? Right. And um, we've spent all this time talking about how we're going to provide, you know, all the risks, all the benefits, all the steps and, and all this information. But but someone really may not want that. Right. Um, I, I think about, uh, you know, it, say you're doing a blood draw. Right. Do they want to know every single step and everything you're doing or would they prefer that you uh, distract them talking about uh, the weather or their pets. Right. Or maybe they don't want you to talk at all. And what they really want is for you to stay quiet and to let them do their own sort of breathing and calming regulation. Right. Um, but you won't know if you don't ask. Right. If you just sort of autopilot or do what feels comfortable for you. Um, also, um, when we're talking about communication, really important to think about providing written information, uh, both at a reading level that is accessible and language that is accessible. Um, remembering that our brains just don't process that well in the moment, not to mention that we all fall uh, into the trap of, of acronyms. I did it today with LARCs, right? We fall into sort of our own vernacular and we need to really think about how we can uh, make things as accessible for uh, patients and clients as possible. Um, so that they can remember, so that they can take notes maybe. Maybe that's how they learn and process. Um, and remembering that conversation we had earlier about the way that trauma impacts the brain, that when trauma is involved, our brains especially don't process, right? Um, so, so that's really important as well. Um, and then trust and permission. Um, we can't assume a right to someone's body, okay? Um, we also have to remember that no one owes us a disclosure, okay? Um, so when we talked about uh, applying a trauma-informed approach um, universally um, and not doing that, well, if I know someone has a history, you don't need to know, right? Um, certainly the more we know, the better we can provide care um, and the better we can tailor our services and all the things, but no one owes you a disclosure. And especially for people who have experienced negative um, uh, uh, interactions um, or experiences in um, in a healthcare environment or in a sexual and reproductive um, uh, education context, whatever it is, um, they may not want to disclose, and we still uh, we still need um, to provide this full uh, range of care to them and this this style of care to them. Um, so again, um, trust it, uh, applies in a whole bunch of ways here. Um, one, remembering that it is one of those schemas that is specifically altered by trauma, needing to keep that in mind when we approach people and work on building relationships. And finally, um, and perhaps most importantly of everything today, is trusting that the people that we're serving are the experts of their own lives and circumstances. So while we bring expertise and experience, they know the best, right? And we need to give that trust um, and work with them in that context. So at 1.59, I'm so excited that we got through it exactly on time. Um, a handful of slides with references for you. Um, and then I'd be delighted to take any questions. I don't know, Megan, can people come off mute or does it have to be through the, through the chat? Because I'm happy to talk if people can, but I don't know if we can. Yeah, so there should be an option um, if you click open the, uh, I think there's a raise your hand button at the bottom. And if you click that, I should be able to see, and then I can allow you to talk and you can come off of mute. So we can go about it that way if uh, there's anybody who would like to ask their question out loud. Or uh, use the chat, whatever you'd prefer. It's totally fine. Yep. Okay. So the first question that we have is how would you prompt someone to open their legs? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, I try to avoid the language of open legs because um, I think that in itself can be activating. Um, we talked a little about that strategy around um, 
you know, uh, let your knees fall open to meet my hands um, or fall out to meet my hands um, can, can be sort of concrete. Um, sometimes I'll talk about, you know, let your knees fall to the side, um, let your knees fall to the side like you're doing yoga um, works for some people really well. Um, and, you know, there's also different positions that you can try, right? You don't have to use those foot rests, right? Um, the, the table has a, a section that kind of comes out also, and you can uh, ask the patient to rest their feet on the outer corners of the, um, of the table, and that can work, um, or kind of a diamond or frog leg shape can work also. Um, so again, another place where we've got lots and lots of choice and options. Um, for, for both physical and sort of um, psychological and, and emotional comfort there. Thanks. What else? Um, you can submit your question via the Q&A, raise your hand or through chat. Um, I left my contact information up there. I'm always happy to talk about any of this or answer any um, questions that you don't feel comfortable um, putting out to the to the larger group. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out to talk about any kind of trauma informed care, vicarious trauma, any of those things. Um, I'm always excited to to be a resource and connect on that. Okay, next question. How do you talk about trauma with younger patients? I'm a pediatrician, which is why I'm asking. Yeah, um, what a great question. So, um, you know, you're always gonna meet them where they are. Um, I think that kids are smarter, and you know this as a pediatrician, right? Um, uh, kids know more than we think they know. <laughs> um, and um, and they, they get more than we think they get sometimes. So, um, you know, um, when I teach about intimate partner violence, we talk a lot about, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll sometimes hear from, um, from, often women or, or the, the partner who um, is experiencing abuse. Um, well, my partner would never hurt the children, right? Um, they're a wonderful parent or whatever. And so, so I can take it kind of things. And we know that just witnessing violence or being aware of violence in the background is also really, really harmful to children, right? The fact that the blows aren't directed at them or that the, um, the, the words aren't directed at them doesn't spare them from, um, from kind of uh, achieving that ACE score, right? Um, um, and having and having that that uh, that change happen. So I think just sort of asking honestly and communicating honestly at, at, at an appropriate level, right? Um, is the place to start, um, but not to be afraid. I think sometimes we're afraid to talk about hard things with children um, and they need to know that you're a safe space. Um, this is true for, for kids and, and also for anyone you're working with. Remember, that, like we talked about, they don't know you a disclosure. Someone may not tell you the first time that you, um, that you ask, right? But just by asking or by raising these um, questions and concerns, they now know that you're a safe place, or at least you're signaling that you're a safe place where they could come um, if and when they're ready to talk. Um, and to ask questions. So I think um, the more that you bring it up and the more that you um, connect, kind of the better, right? Um, without feeding them scary thoughts, right? Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is being non judgmental or stigmatizing. Um, is there a good resource for providers to help them do this? I'm, a, I'm in public health and we have issues here surrounding judgment from providers. This is causing especially young people to not reach out for care. Oh, that's so hard. What a good question. Um, I don't know of a concrete um, great resource other than like 
promote trainings like this and other good networking and discussions, but often, unfortunately, as with so many things, the people that are showing up for discussions like this aren't necessarily the people that where there's where there's difficulties in those um, arenas. So um, I will look for a resource and see what I can find. And if anyone else knows of any, please throw that in the chat for everyone's benefit. Um, but I think a big part of it is just getting some of this information out there. Um, in some ways, COVID is good for this because I think people start to resonate to the idea of universal trauma a little bit more, right? Um, in spite of all the polit politicization, um, people understand that we've been living a really hard couple of years, right? Um, and so, and so sometimes I think we can start to uh, sneak this into conversations um, more because of that. Now, if we're thinking about just sort of uh, judgment and stigma around sexual health topics um, uh, and less, less around trauma specifically, um, I mean, it's just training. It's just, it's, it's finding, it's also for you um, trying to curate, and I'm sure you're doing this already, but a good list of referrals and resources. And that of course is gonna depend on where you are and, and who's in your orbit and world and how much control you have over where, where they end up and all these things that are out of our control, which is part of why this is also frustrating and why I'm so happy to be with you all today. Um, but I think it's just starting to find the right providers and then also um, to talk to the people that are sort of on that cusp and help them shift their language, give them ideas. Um, if you have that opportunity, which we don't always. Thank you. Um, there is a comment in the chat. A lot of work is being done in the schools regarding ACEs, so likely they have heard about them. Yes, thank you, Rachel. That's absolutely right. Yeah, it, it is It is neat over just the last few years. Um, not everyone has heard of ACEs, but it is much more common for me to come into a room and, and say, you know, who's heard of this? Who is it new to? And, um, and many more people have heard of ACEs um, than, than even just a few years ago. I think a quick plug, I'm pretty sure HCT has an archived webinar on ACEs, right? Um, that Megan can say more about, hopefully, maybe? Um, I don't think I can say more about okay, cool. it because I think we have quite a few, um, but those can be found on our um, website. Um, we are archive all of those, so you can go back and watch and um, see who presented. Typically, those uh, presenters' contact information is within those, so if there are any questions to follow up with them directly, um, you have that opportunity. But I know we have at least two in the past few years. So definitely a great place um, to go. Um, and then there's another comment um, by Rachel in the chat um, for the pediatrician on the call. It is reassuring to know if you ask or have conversations with that population, they would know. All right, we do have a few more minutes, so please keep those questions um, or comments coming through. Um, and while we wait for a few more, if there are any more questions, um, I just want to remind everyone um, that these slides were sent out to you um, this morning and yesterday. If you did not receive those, please email um, myself or um, the updates at hct.org email, and those can be sent out to you directly. Um, and if you are wanting to receive nursing contact hours, follow-up will be in the uh, communication sent out later this afternoon on uh, what forms you have to fill out and who to send those to. Um, so please be aware of that, as well as um, the three-month follow-up for those uh, nursing contact hours, um, just to see where you are at um, as it pertains to this current webinar, um, webinar's objectives. Um, which will be important for um, our internal evaluations. And I will give it a few more minutes for any uh, last min minute questions, comments, um, or anything. Thank you again for spending your time with us today. I really appreciate it. 
And thanks for the work that you do. Um, for those I'm um, looking at the chat, there is a comment um, from Courtney. Um, we have an ACE master trainers in our HR department and education department have been working on trauma-informed implicit bias trainings. The Physicians Network has been sending patients surveys with questions to gauge trauma-informed in overall interactions and care questions. Courtney, that is amazing. That's so great to hear. Thanks. Courtney, where, where are you? Where does that exist? Cool. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions or comments um, and seeing people pop off here and there. Um, so, with um, that being said, I would like to thank Dr. Kara Bergeronik for a wonderful presentation um, and being with us today and providing all of this um, helpful information. Um, as I repeated prior, um, please look out for an email that will follow up with evaluations um, and nursing contact hour information um, if you are wanting to receive those. And with that being said, thank you everyone for your time and participation in this webinar. Um, it's greatly appreciated on HCT's end, as well as I'm sure um, Dr. Kara. So thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thank you.